So let's get into our subject proper. Um, I want to start with a, a little bit of a caveat. When we're doing Bible study, um, particularly on a subject like this, a, a lot of the information we have about the judgment seat, a lot of, the, a lot of our views on the judgment seat, a lot of plays that we've seen on the judgment seat, a lot of talks we've heard on the judgment seat are based on parables. And I just want to make a caveat about basing anything on parables only. And, and, and there is limitations to parables, as we know. Um, parables convey lessons and sometimes overarching grand principles. And, and you know, Brother Roberts mentions this in, I think it's Nazareth Revisited, trying to find uh, minute um, equivalence for every little feature of a parable is not always the purpose of, of parables necessarily. So I just want to make a caveat about parables and basing all our understanding on a subject on parables alone. Um, just off the top of my head, I'm thinking of parables that if we did that, we'd be in strife. Um, the, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, Abraham's bosom, for example. We don't take that literally, do we? Um, there's a principle about if even if one rose from the dead, you're not going to believe, certain people won't believe. So there's an overarching principle, lots of detail in that parable that, that is not necessarily literal. Um, there's parables about Beelzebub that the Lord makes. Um, the parables that involve lakes of everlasting fire. There's parables about seven spirits being cleaned out of, out of a house, etc. And, and the list could go on and on and on. I'm just, I'm just highlighting that to say we've got to be careful about basing a lot of literal things on, on, on features within parables. And we'll make more comments about that as we go. An example of, of where a parable could lead us down a particular path if we weren't careful in our Bible study. And that Bible study involves taking the whole counsel of God into, into uh, consideration, isn't it? Not just focusing on one, one verse or one phrase. Um, we could make an exhortation, for example, based on the ratio of, of believers who are going to be saved as opposed to those that are going to be rejected. We could, we could base a whole exhortation on, on one parable and, and come to a conclusion in an exhortation. So we could say, for example, the parable of the virgins, the ten virgins, we could say, well, there was five wise and five foolish, 50% saved, 50% rejected, and I could do an exhortation saying, well, you know, half of you guys are cumbling. I reckon that half going to be rejected and this and the half save so yes you're okay so we could we can we could draw a conclusion on that based on the, the the statistical information here in the parable half half and it's based on scripture it seems to have some sort of credibility until we go to another parable and the ratio is significantly different so we've got the sower parable where there are three grounds that are unacceptable only one ground that that brings forth fruit then we go to the parable of the talents and in the parable of the talents You've got two accepted, so we're at you know seventy percent or whatever. We got one. We got one percent rejected, thirty percent. So the ratio is all over the place, depending on which parable I I choose to base my exhortation on. The parable of the pounds, which is almost identical to the parable of the talents, virtually very similar in the in the in the sort of the logistics and what happens in that parable. Yet the ratio is totally different. Nine accepted and only one rejected. So we got ten percent rejected, ninety percent accepted. So We'll take this part, that part, and yeah. So, so we, as you can see, we just got to be careful when we're when we're doing Bible study about how we how we ascribe some of these things. The penny a day parable. Well, we might talk about that a bit more. But in that parable, all receive a reward. Everyone who's working in the field, there's a hundred percent rewarded in that particular parable. The parable of the wedding garment. There's thousands there at the wedding, and one man is picked out who hasn't got an appropriate garment. So we could draw a whole exhortation on that saying 0.0002% are rejected. So, so just be careful when we're using parables, if we're, just, we're, we're doing an exposition or, or a talk or an exhortation or a, putting together a play or something like that on basing that on one parable. Just, that's just my uh, caveat at the start of our considerations. Another consideration, you know, another example I should say on on using parables. Let's say you were writing a play on, on the parable, on, on the judgment seat. In fact, I remember doing a play with my wife um, many years ago when we were young people. We did a play on the judgment seat and my wife got rejected, which I think is quite appropriate. So she was a, she was a rejected person. Yes. Um, 
if I was going to write a play, how would, how would I structure the order of events? Where would I draw on for that? Which parable would I go to to say how, how the logistics of the, of the, of the judgment set would work? Because if I took the parable of the talents and I'm writing the play, it would work like this. Everyone would be gathered to the Lord. They would give account of what they have done. They would receive a comment from the Lord as to, as to their performance or, or what they've achieved. And then they would be either rejected or they would enter into his joy. So that would be the, that's how I would structure that particular play. But if I went to another parable instead, I went to the sheep and goats parable, which is only a, a few verses away. The order is significantly different. In that parable, everyone is accepted or rejected immediately up front. Sheep on one side, goats on the other straight away. And after that, the reason is given. And then after that, they're either rewarded or punished. So, so that's interesting. That that whole order of events is quite is quite different within the space of a few verses. Interestingly enough, I I really like the order of the sheep and the goats, and and, and this is going to come out a bit more in our studies as we progress as a as a suggested um, order of events. It yes, it is a parable. The sheep and the goats is a parable, just as the talents and the pounds and and the others are parables too. But it is actually a parable about the judgment seat. The others is a parable about a, a man who goes into a far country or a parable about virgins and, uh, at, a, at a wedding uh, event. This is about the actual judgment seat. So in a sense, yes, it's still in parable form, but to me it holds more weight because of the, the, the nature of that parable being specifically about, about the judgment seat itself. We'll say a bit more about that as we go through. Even the response, if I'm, I'm designing this play about the judgment seat, how, how do I get the characters to respond? And, you know, the parable of the talents, the accepted actually explain to the Lord what they've done. You now, my, my talents have made, I've, I've used your talents to make these talents, and, and they actually have to give an explanation of what they've done. Whereas in the parable of the sheep and goats, the accepted are actually unaware of what they've done. They're actually, when, when did we see the unique? When, it's, it's, it's quite different, isn't it? They're not, they're not giving a, an overview of what they've achieved. They're actually unaware to a degree. I think they're unaware that they did it to the Lord, not unaware that they carried out those actions. Sometimes that we're sort of, that's presented as people are just so good and so awesome that they don't even know they've been good. I, I find that hard to believe that you go to a prison and visit someone and you don't realise that you're going to a prison. I think they didn't realise they'd done it to the Lord by doing that to, to one of their fellow servants. Nonetheless, you can see how these parables are in the exact same chapter, in the same context, you know, at the same time period, and yet significantly different if we're to drill down to the microscopic events within, within the parables themselves. Here's another parable in Luke, the parable of the pounds. And there are, there are aspects within the parable that show us that this, this can't be, we can't take it too literally. There's got to be, there's, there's lessons and overarching ideas here. But to take these elements too literally has problems. For example, the Lord calls them together. It says that he might know what they've done. Well, we know that our Lord already knows what we've done. So, so that couldn't be quite literal, that he would know. He, our Lord already knows, so our judge already knows. Um, it's interesting, there's, there's dialogue going on in this parable. People on the sidelines yelling out things. You know, someone, someone there's people yelling out, but, but Lord, he's already got 10, he's already got... Um, uh, 10 pounds. And the, who are these people interrupting and, and, and questioning the Lord at the judgment seat if they have a, an exact equivalent in, in, in literal reality? Um, actually, this parable has three groups, actually. You've got, you got, you got um, rejected, accepted, and these other group that are taken out and slain. So again, what's the physical, literal equivalent in all those parables? I'm not saying there isn't, but I'm saying that there is divergence between parables that we have to be careful of giving too much weight and too much emphasis on one parable, particularly when we're trying to arrive at a, at a conclusion. And we might, we might make some more comments about that as we go through. Right, we want to get down to the nitty-gritty of things. When I decided to look at this subject on the judgment seat, I, I searched old Christadelphians, old testimony magazines. I, I went through everything I could. Um, to find what was written in the Brotherhood about the subject. But I got more information by just asking people and talking to people. As I said, I, I, I've got relatives and friends and all, all sorts of parts of the Brotherhood, different 
different styles of ecclesias and different, different sorts of things. So I, I get around a little bit and I'm able to talk to people from, with different perspectives, which is quite interesting. And as I ask people about the judgment seat, and what they thought was being achieved by the judgment seat and how the judgment seat fitted in with the atonement, etc., it sort of boiled down to two views. And I want to look at those views tonight and give the evidence for both of those views before we, we make any, uh, any conclusions. Now, these are labels that I've made up, so they're just, they're just my labels. I've called one the short view. That means the judgment seat is not a drawn-out affair, it's not an interrogation, it's not a, it's not, um, a forensic process, it's, it's a very, very quick process, and I'll call it the short view. The emphasis of this short view is, is grace, so, so that's the overarching emphasis that comes out on this particular view. It's based on recognition. So the Lord recognizes his own. He says, that's a sheep, that's a goat. There's no half sheep, half goats, 90% goat, 20% sheep. Actually, my maths is way out there. Um, there's definitely not that. So, so it's a very quick recognition. You're in the book of life or you're not in the book of life. I knew you, I never knew you. you know, so it's, it's a very simple process. There's no, there's no forensic information needed. I, I'm, I'm generalizing here, and again, it's just anecdotal, so don't hold me to it. But I find people who hold the short view, generally, in my experience, have a positive view of the atonement. So they, they see, of the, sorry, of the judgment seat. A positive view of the judgment seat in regards to their own personal position. So they usually think, the short, pe short view people usually think that their likelihood of being accepted is high. And that's just, I'm just generalizing. And the parable that they would rely on or they would focus on is the sheep and the goats. They would say it's a sheep or a goat. It happens straight away. Discussion happens later and, and that, that is done right at the very start of the process. So that's, that's the short view. I'm just, I'm making another guess that I, I think Cumberland is very similar to my ecclesia at Gosford in, in, its, in its sort of culture and its background, etc. And I think that that's a view we're not really um, we're not really conversant with. So I might give some. I might spend a bit of time showing you the evidence for that view because it's probably one that many of you may never have ever heard before or, or come across. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. The second view is what I call the long view. So it's a view that is based on a on a process um, of giving accounts, where we give account of our life and we go through our life and, and we talk to our judge and we receive um, feedback on, on things we have done in our life. The emphasis on this particular view is on works, what we've done and what we haven't done. So that's, that's, that's the big emphasis on this particular view of the judgment seat. It's based on this concept of giving account, which is a, uh, an interesting Greek word. Um, it's actually a bookkeeping term, actually. So it's a, it, it denotes a meticulous bookkeeping keeping of, of records. Okay? And we need to give account of what we've done or not done. Again, I'm generalizing here. So any, any generalization, please, I'm, I'm just saying in my limited experience, I find over, generally the long view people have a more negative perspective on the judgment seat as far as, as getting through that process. I mean, I mean when you think about, you think about what's at stake, that your, your life is examined, you're, you're opened up, as the word fanaru means, you're opened up and exposed, your inner contents of your heart are exposed, uh, your, your motives are read, all those things, and, and then a result comes from that. It's, it's, there's usually a negative view of that, or, or what I might... Um, uh, it, it's it's a, a limited acceptance, you know, a smaller group accepted than, than a, a rejected rather than accepted. And the parable of the talents, the parable of the pounds would, would go along with that view that people are called together and have to give an account of what they've done and, what, and if they have failed to do something, then that is also um, exposed as well. And that's, you know, when I said we've done plays when I was a young person, that's pretty much how the plays went when we, we put a play together. It was pretty much focused on, on the talents and pounds type parables. What I want to do, I, I want to keep you awake, because I'm not going to go laboriously through the evidence for both of these views, but I, I'll, I'll do it in an overview way, and um, hopefully you'll see that both of them have, have very strong scriptural backing, I suppose. 
the first view, and the proponents of the first view would pretty much focus on the fact that we're, we're forgiven, that we're under grace, and where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And that would be, the, I suppose, the focus on this view. They would also say, proponents of this view would say as well, um, when, as Christadelphians, when we expound the Bible, clear literal doctrinal statements take precedence over, over parable and over, over certain, certain things that would, that would seem to contradict what the clear views and the clear doctrinal views say. I hope that makes sense. I'll give you an example. The subject of the, the supernatural devil or defining the devil. For example, you can read many parts of scripture that seem to say that there's a, there's a devil, there's a person, a personage called the devil. The devil enters into the heart of Judas Iscariot or, or Ananias and Sapphira or, or, or Satan or, or the devil goes out into the wilderness to tempt Jesus, etc. There seems to be this, this personage called the devil. Um, he's like a, a roaring lion in, in 1 Peter, etc. So we say, some people say, well, that, that shows that there's a supernatural devil doing all this. He takes Jesus into a high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. You know, it looks, it looks like that on the surface. But the Christophian goes, no, there are certain overarching principles. James 1 says, man is, is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And, uh, and the Lord says in Mark 7, out of the heart of man comes you know, evil thoughts, etc. Um, Jeremiah 17 says, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. And, and on those overarching principles, they, they control, if you like, how we read those other, um, on the surface, those other verses that seem to say something contrary to that. And then we have to then bring our interpretation to bear based on those overarching doctrinal concepts. So the people who take view one say the same thing. They say the doctrine of the atonement, grace, forgiveness, all those things are very clear. Romans 4, Romans 8. Uh, Ephesians 1, they're clear doctrinal statements. They, there's no ambiguity. They're very clear. So if there are parables or, or other statements made that seem to contradict them, then they are the ones that need to be, to be understood differently, not, not the clear overarching principles. So that, that's where proponents of view 1 would, would sit. They would look at these boldness verses that we, we've, we've referred to a little bit. We'll come back to them in our exhortation later on in the week. But... You know, 1 John 2 and 1 John 14 talks about this possibility of having boldness or, or confidence. That word boldness, um, it, it's got the idea of, of being frank and speak. It's the, Greek, the Greek word literally is all speaking, which means you're not, you're not holding back. You're, you're speaking with frankness and openness um, and not shrinking away in shame. The possibility of doing that in front of Christ or at the judgment seat is... is All the things that you failed to do in your life have been brought out. It's, it's hard to imagine that could ever, ever happen, that you could have any confidence or boldness uh, on the day of judgment. So that would, that would point to that as saying your view of the judgment seat needs to build into it that reality that there, are, there is a possibility of having boldness or confidence in the day of judgment. Then there's also a lot of emphasis placed on, say, Romans 8 verse 1. There is no condemnation, which is one of our judgment words. And it means no negative judgment against. I feel like there's no negative sentence against those that are in Christ Jesus. So that's got to be taken into account as well. Interesting verse in John 5. Now, this might get a bit technical, so I'm going to flick through this quickly, and you can grab the slides and follow it through later on if you, if you really want to follow it through. But those who hold to the short view of the judgment seat... Um, very much relying on some of the statements here in John 5. Now, just, just have a look at John 5. And it's the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the context is he's just healed the man uh, at the pool. And let's find John 5. And it's on the Sabbath. This is, this, is the, this is the background to the story. So it's at the pool of 
Bethesda he heals the man, tells him to take up his bed and walk, the man that was there for 38 years and the water stirring and all that. But the important thing for, to note now is it was on the Sabbath. The Jews criticised Jesus for this Sabbath day action. He was working on the Sabbath. Jesus responds in verse 17, says, My father works, therefore I work. Okay, so God works on the Sabbath and I also work. They then have another quarrel with Jesus, more so because not only was he working on the Sabbath, but now it would appear that he's making himself equal to God by that, by that response. My father, God works, I work. Jesus puts that to bed and says, I'm not equal to God. In verse 19, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. So I'm just following my father. I'm not equal. And then he says in verse 20, in fact... You're going to see greater works than these. Okay, so just bear that in mind. So he says, I've healed this man. My words have actually raised this man off the ground, like revitalized him, regenerated his limbs and, and giving him, giving him life, you know, in a sense. He says, however, I'm going to do greater things than this. And then verse 21, he says, again, linking himself to God again, as the father raises up the dead and quickens them or gives them life, even so the son quickens whom he will. Okay, so Jesus not only quickens, which means to give life, but he chooses or he has authority delegated to him to do that to people, to give life. Now he gives, and, and then he says in verse 22, for the father judges no man, but it's actually committed or delegated all judgment unto the Son. So Jesus has been given the power both to judge or choose, if you like, or judge or select, and to give life. Now he's going to give us two examples of that, and I've just put, I'll put these up on the screen. One is in verse 24 to 27, and he says, Verily I say unto you, He that hears my word and believes on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment or condemnation, but he's passed from death unto life. Verily I say unto you, verse 25, the hour is coming and now is. Okay, keep that little phrase in mind, now is. Okay, so he's talking about something that was happening right there and then. Then later on in verse 28, uh, sorry, verse, yeah, verse 28, marvel not at this, for the hour is just coming. Not now is, is coming. And those that are in the grave shall hear my voice. So there's two, there's two. Jesus has the ability to give life, to use his own judgment. It's been delegated unto him to use his own judgment and to give life and quicken. One of these quickening events is happening now. The, the hour is coming and now is. I can do it right now. I'm going to quicken people now. And the second event of quickening is going to happen later on. The hour is just coming and the graves are going to be opened. So there is an, an application where Jesus has the ability to judge and to give life on a spiritual, at a spiritual level, a spiritual plane. And in the future, the hour is coming when Jesus can give life on, a, on the physical plane, on the physical level. So we just need to, to see, the, see the difference in those, in those applications. As I said, you can go through this a bit slower later on. Now, this idea of, of receiving life now is, is, it runs through the New Testament and the, probably the most, the most well-known ones, Ephesians 2. You has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together. So, so the idea of being quickened or given life or, or spiritually resurrected spiritually brought to life is, is a valid New Testament concept. And it also is consistently used like that in other places in John's writing, both in the epistle and, and, and in the gospel record. So the first application of Jesus being able to, to judge and to give life on a spiritual level is based on, he says, he that hears and believes. If you hear and believe in me, I will give you life. I will quicken you. Right now, right here and now, as just as Ephesians says, we've been quickened 
in heavenly places in Christ. Now, this is the important, this, this is the important thing. For those who hold the short view concept, the result of this quickening is, if you, if you hear and believe, you have faith, the result is, you shall not come into judgment, but you have passed, you've been transferred from life unto death. So Jesus has the ability to quicken you, give you life right now. Of course, that's not immortal life or eternal life. It's a spiritual concept, isn't it? It's it's basically forgiveness of sins because if your sins are forgiven, you will live forever, isn't it? That's that's, that's a concept really when we sort of get through the language. But but Jesus uses this language. I'm, I'm giving you, I'm quickening you, as Ephesians 2 says, that we've been quickened from our trespasses and sins. Um, but the result is the interesting thing. We've passed from death to life. This, this is a concept also found in other places in the New Testament. In John's writings, 1 John 3 says, we know that we have passed from death to life. Okay, It appears again. This idea that when we believe in Christ, you know when we're baptised and we come into the body of Christ, we haven't just joined a club. We haven't just joined an association. We haven't just, you know, qualified for, the, for some sort of event in the future. It's, it's, a, it's a miracle when we come into Christ. We, we are God's creation. This is, this is an amazing thing. And, and, and we, we, can't, we can't elevate what happens to us when we come into Christ too much. We are part of God's spiritual creation. So scriptures use the terminology of we have passed from death into life. And Colossians has Colossians one's got this very interesting little phrase: "We've been translated into the kingdom of God." That word "translated" has the idea of being transferred, like we've moved from one country to another. And Brother Thomas draws on that that concept in Elbers Israel, doesn't he, about being part of the Commonwealth of one country and then um, changing citizenship and becoming part of another country. So they're scriptural concepts. And the idea of not coming into judgment is also something that 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 is also found in other parts of John's writings. For example, John 3, he that believes on him is not condemned, not judged. But he that believes not is condemned already, actually, by by virtue of, of his natural state. And this is the condemnation or judgment that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light. So light discerns, doesn't it? It reveals. And we're going to see that applied to the the actual physical judgment seat as well. But even in the spiritual level, at a spiritual level, Jesus uh, accepts those who believe on him, quickens them, gives them spiritual life in the sense that they are now uh, in that chess head of Yahweh. They now, they now are forgiven. They're now covered by the blood of the Lamb, etc. And it says they shall not come into judgment. And so then we can look at the second judgment, which is the physical one. John then says there are, he says there's two resurrections, even though we know that there's not really two different resurrections, but he sort of paints it in this light, or Jesus does, and recorded by John, I should say. There's a resurrection he calls of life and a resurrection of judgment or condemnation. Those who are resurrected now in the spiritual sense, those that, are, that have been transferred into God's kingdom now, shall not come into judgment. They are, they are resurrected to life. Those who aren't part of that, of course, are, res- are part of the resurrection of judgment. So I know I've rushed through that very quickly, and I'm trying, to give, I'm trying to give it a fair hearing, but those who believe in the, 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 the sort of... The, they don't think the judgment seat's a forensic process or, or, or a probing uh, concept. It's, it's, it's purely the Lord making a declaration of his, who are his and who are not his. Um, draw on that and say those who are part of the first resurrection, the spiritual resurrection, um, who believe and are quickened in Christ, do not come into judgment in, 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 a, in a negative sense. All right. When I first heard that, I thought, okay, that sounds interesting. But there are so many other parts of Scripture that, that seem to say something different. For example, the parable of the ten virgins. That seems to me to say that and this is how I, I took the parable. The oil is the word of God. We can let that oil run low by, 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 by not 
uh, studying God's word, reading God's word and, and moving away from God's word and the oil levels get low and we need to top them up again and come back into the meeting or do our readings and get, get more oil back into our, our lamp or else if Christ comes and our oil levels are low, then we're in strife. So I, I, I presented that to someone who believed in the short, the quick, the quick ju judgment seat theory. Their response was, well, you need to look at the parable in the context of what it was giving and what the purpose of the parable is. And the parable is part of the Olivet Prophecy. And one of the overriding principles of the Olivet Prophecy is that Christ was not about to set up his kingdom here and there. And in fact, in Luke 19, um, this is referring to the, the parable of the, the pounds, I think. He says, he spoke a parable because... He was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. So that's, that's the background of these parables. You've got to keep that in mind. They thought he was going to set up the kingdom here and now. Jesus then gives us the Olivet Prophecy. The question that sparks the Olivet Prophecy that we all know, you know, they say, when shall these things be? Tell us, when shall these things be? Is it all about to happen right here and now? That was what they were expecting and hoping well, Jesus gives them this prophecy that is like a sweep of history from that from from you know 70 AD and takes us right through to to his return, you know, in our era. And the point was in his in the Lord's answer, he says, You're going to hear of wars, rumors of wars, you're going to hear of trouble in the world, but the end is not yet. Okay, things are going to keep going on for tens, hundreds, even thousands of years. Nation's going to rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And then he makes this statement here that I think is, is going to be a, a fundamental principle for our, our studies right through the week. But just for now, help us um, understand where, where this point of view is coming from. He that endures to the end shall be saved. Christ wasn't about to set the kingdom up there and then. There's a lot of water under the bridge. He's got a lot of... Lot of a lot of prophecy has to be fulfilled. Thousands of years are going to happen. He that endures to the end shall be saved. So endurance is really the key to this parable at the end of the day. So we'll come back to that principle later on. The endurance, staying in the household of faith, you know, staying in God's family. That, that's, that's a real key to this subject. Then the sh these, those who um, hold to the short view say... You know those, those lamps that the ten virgins have are often depicted in Sunday school books and at Florida's nights as the little, uh, the little lamps that we hold with oil in them. In fact, the word, if you look at the word, it's actually different than those lamps. The word is actually a torch. It's, uh, it's used five times in the New Testament. It's used, for example, when the, the soldiers come and uh, arrest Jesus um, in Gethsemane. They came with the torches. It's, it's not a lamp that holds that actually holds oil at all. They were, they, were, they were torches. They often had leather or animal hide on one end and they were dipped into a flask. Then they were lit. Okay, so, so it sort of changes the whole you know, levels concept a little bit. Let's keep going. When we look at the five foolish, what was it that they failed to do? It says they took their torches, which is, just a, which is a lamp, the, the lamps are the torches, but they took no oil with them. Now I want to emphasize that word no. It wasn't like their oil ran out or they, they sort of stopped, stopped doing their readings, their oil disappeared. They took no oil with them at all, nothing. They just had their torches. The wise though took oil in their vessels, which is like a flask, separate to the torch. They also took their torch, because the torch was a stick, it was a, it was a stick thing, and they took a flask that had oil in it. So it's a very, we're coming back to a very binary presentation here. Oil or no oil. Okay, the, the idea of, of levels being judged or, or considered is, is not really part of this parable. And if you tie that into the principle of the Olivet Prophecy, the, the wise virgins were prepared to endure to the end. Whether that was a state of mind or whether, whether that is faith that, 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 that is more strongly grounded and rooted in, 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 um, in their hearts than the others, like, like, like the soils. It's, it's, a, it's, something, it's like 
It's like taking a spare fuel tank on a, on a trip through the desert, if you like. It's got, you've, got a, you've got an emergency fuel tank. You've got, you've got oil there that'll get you through, through the journey. So the five the foolish were not prepared for a long wait. There is no measurement of levels mentioned, the lamp's been filled periodically or updated or anything like that. It's very much you either have oil or you don't have oil. And those who didn't have oil were not there when, when the Lord comes at the end of the day. And, and, and that's how the short, the short view people see everything quite black and white, that you either are in or out. You're a goat, you're a sheep, you're in the book of life, you're not in the book of life, I knew you, I never knew you. You've got oil or you don't have oil. You know, you've got faith or you don't have faith. It's very much in that, in that, in that, in that light. Here's how they would see... Here's a timeline. Of the, here's, the, here's our, you know, chess head border, if you like, uh, the, being in the, in the pale of salvation. We start off at baptism and we, we travel through to the end, whether that's our end of our life or, or the return of Christ. Those who have no oil will be manifest because they won't be there at the end. Okay, they, they, they won't be there at all. Oops. Um, and, and sadly, we know people who just have no, didn't have, not have oil in their lamps. It's, it's, you know, a brother leaves his wife and runs off with some, some girl at work and leaves the truth altogether. We've, we've seen that happen in our own experience. A brother leaves the truth and joins a Pentecostal church. Another brother and sister just drift away from the meeting, become atheists and, and, and give the truth away. They had no oil at all in their lamps. Okay, and they did, not have, they did not endure to the end. When trials came or problems came, they, they drifted away and were not, were not there at the end of the process. So that's, that's how short, the short uh, view people would see some of these parables. Even some interesting comments about the parable of the talents. They point out that um, in these parables, and a lot of the examples we have in Scripture, the Bible purposely doesn't give us a a grading or, or lowers the bar or, or gives us some sort of grey area on acceptance. It's really this very binary presentation. You either have zero or a hundred. That's, that's sort of how the presentation goes. Um, for example, in the parable of the talents, the unfaithful servant does absolutely nothing. Does He does nothing. He's zero. He wraps it up in a, in a sweat cloth and and buries it in the earth, does zero, does nothing at all. Okay, so he, it, it's like he that received one talent, digged it in the earth, and that was it. It, it did nothing with it. And at the other end of the spectrum, these people get 100%. Yeah, they double whatever potential was there, whatever talents they had, whatever um, opportunities they have, they, they maximise them and, and they have a 100% response. It's interesting how Scripture presents it like that. There's no... You know, it's, it, it, it's not like, oh, some people did this and that. It's zero to 100, in, in a sense. They that had five talents went and traded them and made another five. You know, it's a very, very high-level result that, that they achieved. And, and many of the presentations in Scripture have that sort of zero to 100 concept. So is it, is it that salvation then, if we're going to look at that parable and, and take it literally, in a sense, is salvation then only for those who... Re who achieve 100%, because that's all that, that's the only options given in this peril, 100% result or zero. There's a little hint that the Lord gives us, which is an interesting hint. In Matthew 25, 27, when the Lord castigates the, the, the man with one talent, he says, he says, look, you ought to just at least put my money to, the, to usury, to the exchanges, and at my coming I should have at least got interest on it, at least got interest. And the implication there is, I, I would have that would have been that would have been good enough. I would have at least accepted that. That's the implication. He says, "Thou oughtest to at least have done that." Um, so I, I actually googled uh, Wikipedia. I think it was one of those reliable resources, and just looked at interest in the Roman interest during the Roman Empire during the time of Christ. I thought, what sort of interest did, the, did these people pay? It's very similar to ours today to some degree. So the interest rate during this time in the Roman Empire was about four to seven percent interest around AD sixty, which is quite interesting. Is that saying that instead of salvation being based on hundred percent, the Lord said, even if you had have put the money to usury to, to at least put it in the bank and got some interest on it, I would have accepted that. If we want to, if we want to take these things uh, 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 to that level of, of literality. 
Another thing that worried me, I suppose, when I talked to uh, the short view people was the whole idea of faith without works is dead, particularly from, from the book of James, as we know. James is all about you've got to be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. And James is very clear, faith without works is dead. Therefore, we need to demonstrate faith, surely. Um, and that faith has to be seen in, in actions. And isn't, isn't that what's happening at the judgment seat that's been analysed? It's interesting, the statements in James that refer to this, again, are pretty binary. Um, James says, even so, faith, if it has not works, zero works, is dead. He doesn't sort of give a gradation or, 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 or sort of say some work. He says, no, faith, you've got either faith or no faith, which is quite interesting. Um, James 2.20, wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without, without works is dead? Uh, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Okay, so you either have faith, and he uses this example of a body. So in this example, we've got a body, a human body. The body in the example represents, or, or, is, or, or yeah, represents in this picture, faith. So I've got, a, I've got a body, faith. This body's dead without, without works. So works, he uses the word spirit or life, the ruach is, is in this body. If it's, got, if, it's got, if it's got works in it, it's alive. Although we use the term half dead, there's no, there's no such reality as half dead, is there? You, you are either dead or alive. You are dead or alive. It's, it's a very binary thing. If there is life in you, you are alive. Or you're dead. There's, there, there, there's, there's, no, there's no, you know, if you've got a pulse or your brain's alive, you are alive. In this sense, the short viewers would say, if you have faith, there's no, there's no, there's no grading of faith or levels of faith. If you have faith, you are alive. And then again, the examples that James uses have got this zero to 100 aspect about them. So, so if, you've got, if you've got no faith, sorry, no works, no works at all, then you're dead. And so it's easy to determine if you're, if you're dead or alive. You've got zero works, no works, you're, you're a dead body. Do you have zero works? Do I have zero? Well, I mean, you're here today instead of sailing around the Gulf, aren't you? So, so there are, there's, a, there's a work of some sort. So, so are we saying zero works or some works? Um, the examples he gives are quite interesting on this 0 to 100 thing as well. Look at this example here. He says in James 2, one sees his brother or his sister, a Delphos or a Delphae, it's, it's, it's a brother in Christ. You know, you see your brother or sister in Christ. Look at the state they're in. Naked. So they're, they're exposed to the elements. They're freezing. They're naked and they're destitute. So this is a pretty extreme example, isn't it? And you see your brother and sister, your Delphos, and they're destitute and naked. I mean, that's a pretty degrading picture. And you say to them, be warmed and filled. Warmed, correlating to the nakedness. Filled, correlating to the destitute. Be warmed and filled and do nothing to help them. Then you've got zero works. I mean, that's, that's a psychopath, isn't it? Like, so it could, you know, someone who says to someone who's destitute and naked, be warmed and filled. We're at zero here, aren't we? This is a zero works response. And then on the, on the other extreme, he's got Abraham who was willing to take a knife and cut out the jugular of his son on an altar and kill him because he had faith and believed that God would raise him from the dead. I mean, that's, a, that's an extreme example of, of faith that is, is quite uh, remarkable and quite amazing. So again, we've got these, these two extreme examples in, in a sense. Faith without works is dead. Yes, it is. Zero or, or faith. You know, and, and, and that's, again, um, a, a sort of a, a binary presentation there. The other thing is the paradigm of a court. And, and this, is, this is where the, 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 the short view guys say the paradigm of a court when we think of the judgment seat. I mean, the word judgment seat, the beamer, the, ju the judgment seat, it conjures up a decision-making process where, where someone gives their side of a story, someone else presents theirs, a prosecutor, a defence, whatever, and, and, a, and the judge makes a decision. That's sort of what, that's the, that's the sort of paradigm we have when we think of the judgment seat. Is that, does that correlate to what, is, what actually happens? And, and, and is that natural pull we have towards that, that, that paradigm really, really correct? Is it really like a human court? 
Well, there are some significant differences at the judgment seat to our experience of human, the human legal system. One big one is the judge already knows you. Now, in our legal system today, the judge is not allowed to have any connection with the person on trial at all. They've got to recuse themselves if they have any, any connection whatsoever. The judge, in this case, knows the very hairs on your head. Okay, it's, 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 So the, the correlation between a human court and the judgment seat doesn't, doesn't totally gel. And here's another element. Technically, in Christ, we are already declared righteous, which is a legal term, isn't it? Um, we are already declared blameless and sinless, righteous through God's righteous provision in, in, in the atonement. So how does that work? Turning up a court to be judged, but you're already actually righteous anyway. So, so the coral, the, the, equating the judgment seat to a human court, which is what we naturally normally do from based on our own experience, doesn't, doesn't quite work. And then as you read through Romans 8, for example, the whole human court picture seems to break down considerably when you look at some of the, the terminology in Romans 8. You know, Romans 8 verse 1, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And that condemn, the word condemnation pops up throughout the chapter. There's no condemnation because uh, sin is condemned, which is this genius provision of God's that he was able through the, through the sacrifice of his son to condemn sin without condemning the individual, without condemning, and, and, then, and then us being declared righteous and not condemned as well. So sin was condemned, so the individual is not condemned. So there's no condemnation. And then we get down to later on in the, you know, towards the end of that chapter with all these superlative um, statements that Paul throws in there to, to illustrate the, the, the wonder and the grandeur of, of what it means to be in Christ. He says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? So in a court, there's a, there's a prosecutor. Who, who's the prosecutor in this court? Who's actually laying charges against God's elect? He asks the question, is it God? Who well, says, no, it's actually, no. No, God's the one who justifies a legal term as well. God's the one who declares righteous. So he's like, so who's laying charges? Is it Jesus? No, actually, he's your defense counsel. He makes intercession for you. So who's laying charges against us? And, and that, that, that is quite an interesting little picture that's painted there in Romans 8. There is no prosecutor at all in that, in that scenario. So, so the human court scenario that we, we fall back on when we try and uh, picture the judgment seat and put it all together doesn't really answer all the elements of the, that are required at the judgment seat. Okay, so that's, that's the view one. For some of you, that might have been the first time you've ever heard that that view even, even exists, if, if, if that makes sense. Which is interesting, because I've been to some ecclesias, probably different styles of ecclesias than, say, uh, say, say Gosford or, or, or Cumberland, where, where everyone believes that. that the short view is, is the, the, the dominant um, view. And yet in my ecclesias, I, I, there was, I, I'd never heard that ever. So it's, that's interesting. Now we come to look at view number two. And there is enormous scriptural support for view number two as well. Funny, I was, I was at an ecclesia in a more informal environment that we had a Bible class, and I, I was doing this study, and I, was, I presented view number one, and I was presenting this view number two, and this sister got very irate with me. She was very angry. And she goes, this is rubbish, nonsense, nonsense. Stop, to she said, Stop talking about view number two as if God's going to go through your life. Like she was really quite significantly worked up about it. And, um, and I sort of, I'm, I'm Greek as well, so I got worked up back at her, so it was all, it was all good. But I, I, I sort of said, well, I said, you can't just rip verses out of the Bible because you don't like them. You know, like that, that's, that's not how we study God's word. It, just because... It, there are verses that seem to be saying things contrary to you. We're not, I can't just ignore them, and, 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 and nor should we. So, so this is our challenge. We've got, we've got ideas about the judgment seat. All of them seem to have a scriptural, a scriptural base, I suppose. So we've, got to, we've, got to, we've got to talk about these during the week and, and make some sense of this. View number two is probably the more traditional view from our perspective, and it says that there is this sort of detailed examination of our life. 
Uh, the Greek word that pops up is phanaru, which means that an uncovering, opening up. So, so there is this detailed opening up and unveiling of our motives and our life and our works and all those things that are looked at in a, in a detailed way at the judgment seat. There's this concept of giving account. I've already mentioned this. This is a, a bookkeeping term, an accounting term, that we need to give an account of our life. Some of these verses are, are quite specific about, about that. Um, and I think I might have a list of some of them here. And we've heard these verses before. Every idle word and shall speak, they shall give account in the day of judgment. That's, that seems very meticulous, very specific, doesn't it? Um, Romans 14, everyone must give account of himself to God. Verse Peter 4, will give account to him that will judge the quick and the dead. The, in the parable of the unjust steward, they are called to, to give account. So it's, it can't be ignored. It's, it's very much, very much um, part of that, part of that, uh, that view's arsenal of, 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 of supporting verses. Actually, I might just go back to view one. Sorry. Really quickly, sorry. I didn't plan this very well, did I? I've got to go all, that, all the way through that back again. Okay. So view one, I, I really only touched on that verse there. There's, there's a whole lot of other um, sort of uh, uh, proofs as well that, that are brought to bear on this view. Um, the whole concept that your sins are forgiven uh, has to be has to be thought through, and 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 the short view people say your sins are forgiven. That's that's you've got to believe that it's it's you're forgiven. They're, they're remembered no more. And I think you know verses like Hebrews eight, for example, say that your sins are remembered no more. And you have got the imagery of the, the scapegoat taking the sins of the people out into the out into the wilderness, etc. So they're remembered against you no more. Um, Psalm 103, as the east is from the west, you know, this, this sort of infinite distance, is put, your sins are put far from you. So our sins are removed from us. That, that's, 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 you know, scriptural reality 101, isn't it? Sins not remembered. There's a whole lot of verses that talk about the fact that we're saved by grace. You know, Romans 6 says it's, not, it's, a, it's a gift, the gift of eternal life. We're saved by grace, not by works. Romans 4 talks about... Um, Abraham was saved by faith, not by works, because then you could boast and, and say that you achieved something. So there's this big emphasis on grace, on, on, on a gift from God that's not by works at all, which seems to fly in the face of looking at someone's works and then rewarding them accordingly. Um, and lots of other verses, Romans 5, for example, and others that talk about being reconciled with God now and having peace with God now. So is, if, we have, if we are reconciled to God now and we have peace with God now, what on earth is happening at the judgment seat? What, what, why, what could possibly, why would, would our life be opened up like that at all? So there, there are other verses that I, we could talk about as well. Now, if you just bear with me, we're just going to go. Get through these as quick as I can. Trap the young players. Oops. Okay. So in view number, view number two. There's a whole lot of verses that talk about our secrets being revealed, okay? At, 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 at the judgment seat, our secrets are going to be revealed. Um, what are some of those? The, the hidden things of darkness up here in 1 Corinthians 4. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in our excellent. Ecclesiastes 12 is interesting. Sort of, um, I'm just paraphrasing, but it's got this, you know, go your way and eat and drink, but remember for all these things, God will bring you into judgment sort of thing. So, so whoa, you know, what's going on there? So, so it, it's, uh, it's very, very harsh. So it seems very harsh on the surface. So God's going to bring us into judgment. The idea that God's going to review our life is very much, uh, very much um, specified in Scripture, very clearly. Our life will be reviewed. Our secrets are going to be opened up and revealed. Um, even idle words are going to be brought up at judgment. This is an interesting one here, James 3, verse 1. The King James says, Be not many masters, which means teachers, really, knowing that you'll receive greater condemnation, or, or the NIV's got stricter judgment. This is interesting. If we, if, we, if we believe that our eternal life depends upon the judgment seat of Christ and, and, our, and the outcome of the judgment seat, why would you be a teacher? Why would I fly down here and, and carry out this, this, this wonderful job that I'm, I'm privileged to do, but why would I be a teacher if it meant 
that my outcome at the judgment seat is going to be harder. And my eternal, I'm, I'm actually jeopardising my eternal life by, by being a speaker this weekend. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> you think about it. If that, that's what it says. Be careful, teachers, because you will receive stricter judgment. Now, if, if my eternal life is based on the outcome of the judgment seat, then I'm really jeopardising myself by being a teacher. In, and, 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 and that, that. So we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that a bit later on. But view two has a lot of scripture there. So we've got a lot of scripture, principle-based scripture, I think, in view one, very much principle-based and, 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 and conceptual-based as far as, as salvation and grace and, and very beautiful concepts are concerned. And they have answers for the more specific things that, we're, that, that view two would raise. But view two is very much grounded and rooted in Scripture as well, isn't it? That there is a detailed account-giving process that takes place. So we've got view one and view two. Which one are we going to go with? Which is the right one? Well, show of hands? No, I'm only joking. Um, now, this is, this, is a, this is the thing. When it comes to Bible study, when we arrive at a conclusion, when we, when we study God's Word, it's not just having 20 verses that support your position and saying, right, I've, I've arrived at a conclusion, I've got these 20 verses, bang, 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 that can prove my point of view. To arrive at a true conclusion, you need not only to have your 20 verses that support you, but you need to have an answer for 20 verses that seem to be saying the opposite of what you're saying. For example, um, let's say I'm going to debate with a Pentecostal minister on the Trinity, for example. So we're going to have a debate. No, not, not me. Let's say, let's say um, there's, a, there's a debate on uh, some, some theology college is holding a debate. They've got a Unitarian who doesn't believe in the Trinity and they've got a Trinitarian and they're going to have a debate. So the Trinitarian turns up with his 20 verses. He's got all these verses, John 1, the word was in the beginning with God and Philippians 2 and, 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 and Proverbs 8 and um, Thomas saying, my Lord and my God in, is it John 21 and... Or, you know, all, all, the classic, all the classic verses that, that are used by Trinitarians. So he's got, this, he's got his 20 verses that he thinks proves that, you know, Hebrews talks about Jesus creating the world and all these sort of things. So he's got his, he's got his verses to prove the Trinity. That's, that's, that's the first verse you've got up there. Yes, yes. I believe that is 100% true. That, that, is, that is true. Well, yes. I believe there is a there is a process of judgment. That's right. That's right. There is a and we end, and the Lord will judge us for that. Yeah. It is. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Exactly right. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's 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 coming. You're just jumping a little bit ahead, but you're, you're spot on. That's exactly right. Yeah. Absolutely, that's right. So when we when we look at the judgment seat, we can't ignore those verses. They've got to they've got to they've got to be taken into account, and we've got to, as you're doing, we've got to say they're they've got. Absolutely, absolutely. I 100% agree with that. That's that's exactly right. All right. So well, let's you're just jumping ahead a little bit. We're we're getting there. We're getting there. We're still trying to reconcile reconcile the verses and bring them together. That that's what we're trying to do at the moment. So we're almost there. We're almost almost there. So all these verses are 100% true, aren't they? So whatever view we have of the judgment seat has to take them into account. So, we've got all these verses that say this, and we've got all these verses that say something different. Like the, going back to my Trinity example. So, a Unitarian has all these verses that say Jesus is a man, he's um, subservient to God, he's limited in his knowledge compared to the Father. The Trinitarian's got all his views that show Jesus is uh, the creator, he's existed in the past. Dr. Thomas brought all those together in the, in the concept of God manifestation. So in God manifestation, when we understand that Jesus was, well, God was in Christ and he is the divine son of God in that sense, 
we can read all the verses that talk about him being a man and go tick, 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 absolutely true. And we can read all those verses that talk about him, you know, um, Micah 5, you know, his, his goings forth have been from of old. From, we can read that and go, yes, absolutely, because he's God's son. We, we understand that he is God's literal real son. John 1, yes, we can. We can un so the verses aren't contradictory based on Brother Thomas's concept of God manifestation. Does that make sense? Unitarians, they, they have their proofs, okay? Trinitarians have their proofs, but neither of them arrive at the truth because they're not bringing all the verses together. If we just had these verses only and made a whole uh, conclusion just on them without the other ones that talk about grace and our sins being forgiven, we need to bring all of them together to make sense of all of them together, not just take the ones that we want, and reject the others. All of them have we have to. Our, our model has to encompass all of them, and that's what we're that's what we're trying to achieve, and put that together. So we've got to reconcile what appear to be sort of divergent ideas and concepts. Even in the parables, you can see contradictory ideas that need to be reconciled. For example, we've got a penny a day in one parable for everyone. Everyone getting the same reward, one penny. Another parable, we've got proportional rewards. Someone gets five cities, someone gets ten cities. They're getting different rewards. We've got to reconcile those things. One parable has a judgment seat process that's very quick. It's based on recognition, sheep and goats. Another parable has a detailed account where someone is, is you know, has to give account of what they've done in a more detailed way. So... We need to reconcile both of these together. Oops. How have different brethren reconciled these, these concepts in the past? I've got a couple, of, a couple of views that I've come across listening to tapes and, and reading books, and I'll give you those ideas. Um, I call this the Australian view because it seems to be more spoken of by Australian speakers. There is a view that the angels carry out the more detailed um, judgment process that takes time. So that, that's one view in, in certain books. The angels are involved with that. The angels do the, the, the sort of detailed analysis, the detailed giving of account. And then we're taken to the Lord and the Lord then gives us the final verdict, whether we're accepted or rejected. That's, that's one view. And, I said, and as I said... Um, that's more, more an Australian view, if that makes sense. Um, my only cons I, well, I, I don't totally agree with that, as you'll see. One reason is Scripture doesn't actually say it. Yes, angels are at the, involved in logistics at the judgment seat, but there's nowhere that says angels are involved in the judgment process at all. Okay, there's no, none of the verses used by those who hold that view actually say that. So it's, it's more of a, it's, it's an honest attempt to try and reconcile these ideas, okay, that there's a longer, a longer view and a shorter process. But it doesn't, for me, doesn't quite do it. Um, the, other, the other view, the other, I suppose, problem with that is John 5 says very clearly that all judgment has been given to the Son because he is the, the Son of Man. So so Jesus is the one carrying out all, all the judgment process, as far as I can, as far as I can tell. Another view that I've heard on, on, on tapes that I've listened to from the UK have a, a, a sort of ingenious idea that when it says we give account, that it's like when you go to a restaurant and you get the bill at the end of the meal, it's got all the details of the account, but you get this final... Uh, amount at the bottom that you've got to pay for at the end of, end of the meal. So there's all the, the entrees and the desserts and everything, but it's the final result. So they say that um, giving account is not literally giving account, but all the events are wrapped up in the final verdict. So it's a, it's a, short, it's a shorter process, but it encompasses all those other events, and, and the giving account is all uh, culminated or, or totally brought together in the, in the end result, if that makes sense. I have a problem with that one too because, like was pointed out, these verses are very specific about, about giving account, aren't they? Every idle word, 
you must give account to, to our judge. You know, they're very specific. So you, I don't think that answer is, is, is enough to, to, to take away the specific nature and the literal and specific nature of, of giving account. So I have another suggestion, which we'll be sort of um, pursuing a little bit. Um, we're, we're talking about reconciling things. We're trying to reconcile the parables, reconcile doctrinal concepts about forgiveness with, with giving accounts, even though our sins are put far from us as the east is from the west. So we're trying to reconcile these things. Here's another, another apparent issue here that we need to reconcile. It's even the Apostle Paul's own view of his salvation, which is quite interesting. We've got here this verse in 1 Corinthians 4 where Paul says, he says, I know nothing by myself. What it means is I, I, have no, I know nothing against myself. Um, my, conscience is, my conscience is clear, yet I'm not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. Now we'll look at this verse in a bit more detail, but for now, Paul is saying he doesn't, he's not 100% sure how he will... Um, fair at the judgment seat. He thinks his conscience is clear. He says, I know nothing against myself, but it's not until the judge looks into my inner man and my, my, the counsels or the intents of my heart that I will know for sure. So it would appear that Paul doesn't know how he's going to fare at the judgment seat. And yet then we've got his famous statement in 2 Timothy 4, where he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all there also that love his appearing. He's got a, a very confident declaration of receiving the crown of life. And yet the first Corinthians is saying, well, at the judgment seat, I won't know until the Lord comes who will reveal the hidden things of the heart. Again, they appear that there, there is an apparent issue that we need to build into our, our view, um, and, and that's, that's what we're going to try and do, God willing. So how do we reconcile these two different, two different views? We've got a short view that, that seems to be based on grace, based on forgiveness, based on the fact that we're covered by the blood of the Lamb, that we're, we're declared righteous by God, um, based on faith, and then we've got a long view that says our life is going to be examined in, in, in detail um, and, and looked at in a, in a minute way. How do, we, how do we reconcile those views? My suggestion is, and this is what we're going to pursue in the rest of our studies, instead of seeing them as two different views, as, as competing views, as something there that's either or, they are both part of the judgment seat process. The sheep and the goats does reflect what happens and so there is there is a culling that the Lord does where he accepts his own and rejects others that that happens in a short process but that's not the end of the work that the Lord's doing with us and there's another part of the process where our lives are examined and we have to give an account and we have to we have to face condemnation in, in, in a sense. We have to face um, uh, the Lord uh, being angry with us about things. We have to also face uh, where we've done things wrong, even though they're forgiven. And we are also praised for things we've done right. And that's, that's a theme that runs through. We'll look at that later on as well. There's lots of verses that talk about receiving praise at the judgment seat as well, which we don't really think about much because we're sort of so fearful that we're not going to make it, that being praised is not really uh, even on our agenda, but we're going to see that it's very much mentioned in, in the New Testament. So the short view is we are accepted and we are also subject to a review of our life and we have to give an account for what we have done and what we haven't done. So in the normal when I say normal, in my normal view of the, of, the, of, the, of the judgment seat, the elements of the judgment seat went like this. We give an account, 
We receive praise or admonition, and then we're accepted or rejected. Similar, I suppose, in structure to the parable of the pounds and the parable of the talents. If we change those elements to be more aligned to the parable of the, the sheep and the goats, we have this. We are accepted or rejected. We then have to give an account, and then we receive praise or admonition from our Lord. And there are rewards uh, additional to eternal life that are also uh, come uh, brought to bear at this, at, the, at, the, at this stage as well. And there is good, good evidence for that as well, which we'll look at. So we're accepted or rejected. Those who are in the book of life, the sheep from the goats, I knew you or I never knew you. And that is based on grace. That's based on on the on the, the chess set of Yahweh, it's based on the fact that we are in the house, we are in the ark, we are in Christ. We are we, the, the atonement is effective, and we are covered, and we in that way. However, our works have to be examined. Our life will be reviewed. Our motives are examined, and then we receive praise or admonition. So. We are seeing the judgment seat as the final phase of, of God manifestation, of the final phase of being prepared for immortality. It's the final refinement process, if you like. All our life, we've been subject to trial and to, and to, and to difficulties and our faith has been refined in the fire. But at the judgment seat, there is an intense, under the... the, the Perception of our Lord Jesus Christ, who knows our very heart, there is an intense, accelerated version of that that prepares us for immortality. And I, I find these words in Psalm 139 reflect, in a sense, what, what has been achieved at the judgment seat. Search me, O God. And this is going to be the theme as we move through the judgment seat um, quotes. This idea of searching us. God is searching us. Not so much in a forensic way to, to eliminate us out of, out of the kingdom. He could do that in just one hour of my life if he really wanted to. He's searching me to purge me, to remove from me any wicked way so that I can be a king and priest in his kingdom. Search me, O oh God, and lead me in ways everlasting. And this, this is what the judgment seat is achieving. This is what it's... It's, there's a purpose behind it, which we'll, which we'll look at. It's the final phase of our transformation when, when it is all brought to bear and our motives are opened up and our, our thoughts and intents of our heart are revealed. You know, there are lots of things that we, we, are, we are blind of, really, in our, in our own attitudes and our own prejudices and our own behaviours that we don't even realise are wrong doesn't mean we're not faithful and we don't follow God, but there are, there are lots of things we have. We have, we, we have inferiority complexes. There are, there are people with anger issues. There are partiality. I've seen partiality in very faithful people who act differently when their own family are caught up in a situation. It's, it, it's, it's human nature. doesn't mean they're unfaithful and, 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 and they're rejecting God, but they are character flaws that we all have. Now, of course, we examine ourselves now and, and the word of God is working to help us refine those things now. But we are flawed and we, we lack insight in a lot, of, a lot of ways. At the judgment seat, the Lord will see right into our very heart, right into our very soul, and those things can be purged. Those things can be removed. And the behaviours that we've exhibited through our life, be they idle words, be they slackness, be they... Um, uh, laziness, be, be they um, pride, all these things that we've exhibited in our life, yes, they might be forgiven, but they still need to be dealt with. You can't just forgive and then give me immortality. Give, give me, it would not be good. Those things still need to be dealt with and still need to be uh, purged from my thinking and my, my perception because I'm blind to a lot of them to some degree. So these are all things that the Lord will deal with. And, as I said, I believe we'll also praise us for where there, where there are things we've done right, where we've been generous, where we've given without 
showing other people we've done things in private, etc. We will receive um, commendation for that. So that's that's where we want to look at in the rest of our studies. Follow through that idea of a short of 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 being received sheep and goat style, accepted, but but then having to give it an account to our Lord and having admonition or praise from him as part of that process.